Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming out. It's great to see such a uh, sizable audience tonight, so many students here. Uh, I'm Tom Landy. I direct the Reverend Michael C. McFarland SJ Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. I still love being able to, to say that. That's something new. The McFarland Center organizes and supports programming that explores basic human questions integral to our college mission, those of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. One of our lecture series, the Thomas More Lecture on Faith, Work, and Civic Life, does this by honoring a graduate of the college who exemplifies the college's dedication to the integration of faith and learning. Recent Thomas More honorees have included Maria Eugenia Ferrerangel of the class of 89, president of El Nuevo Dia, Dennis Golden, class of 1963 and president of Font Bonne University, B.J. Casson, who's class of 55, president of the philanthropic Casson Educational Foundation, and John Broderick, the Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. You can find recordings of those on our website, www.holycross.edu slash McFarland Center, all in small letters. And tonight's talk as well will be on there. So when you go back from here and say this was great, and you say to your roommate, I should have gone, you can look in a few days and find uh, Donna Wins on there. That's how her, her family is going to, they're going to see her podcast. <laughs> I'm really pleased tonight to welcome Donna Wynn. Last year I asked several Holy Cross staff to nominate a Thomas More lecturer, and several of them uh, expressed really glowing admiration for Donna. Told me they couldn't imagine a better uh, lecturer, a better person for our students to hear from about uh, her experience. Donna graduated from Holy Cross in 1976. She was an economics major and, as a 76 class member, a member of the first graduating class at the college that was co-ed for all four of its years. She met her husband, Alexander Morasco, the class of 74 here, I guess very early on when you were here. Uh, Donna was a pioneer after leaving Holy Cross as well. She built a prestigious career in a male-dominated industry, in finance. She worked for more than two decades at Merrill Lynch and then moved to Oppenheimer Funds. She was president and CEO of OFI Private Investments, a subsidiary of Oppenheimer Funds, from 2001 until her retirement last year. Don is a strong voice for women's financial literacy and for college savings plans. She's also a mother of two sons, Alex and Stephen, and I think some of you here may have known, may know. Steve. Stephen, okay. Uh, as you'll hear in her talk, Donna's life has not been without challenges, but she's responded to them well and is in a great position to talk to all of our students about how to respond to the roadblocks that we meet in life. Today she serves as a member of the college's board of trustees and is an enthusiastic supporter of the college's internship programs working with the Holy Cross Leadership Council of New York to see that we fund 20 to 30 internships each summer. Please join me in welcoming Donna Wynn. Thank you, Tom. And I have to say that after meeting a few people at dinner tonight, I think most of you are far more accomplished than I am, especially at your age. Um, and thank you for taking the time out this evening when it's so hot in here and it's so nice outside. So. Um, I was thrilled to be asked to do this presentation. I don't have as many accomplishments, I would say, as some of the other people who have spoken, but I thought it might be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time talking about what I've learned in the 36 years I've been away from Holy Cross and what I've learned from work and life and hopefully will give you some insight when you start your careers about what kind of things make a, may make a difference to you. The first thing that I've learned is that life is very accidental. And you can't plan for everything. And so sometimes the benefits that you get from an experience that you have or from a job that you've had are nothing that you plan for and have nothing to do with what you thought was going to happen. Second, I would say follow your passions and don't listen to anybody if they tell you to do something else. If you don't like what you're doing, you can't be good at it. And think about it this way. If, you, if five of you are at work, and they're all passionate about it, and you're not. They're going to work harder at it than you, and you're not going to be successful. So don't give up your passion. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how much money you're going to make. If you don't like it, you shouldn't do it. The other thing I would say is don't worry. Be happy. And the reason I say that is that most of the things you worry about don't happen. And if they happen, why do you want to live through them twice? <laughs> right? And the things that do happen, you just have to kind of survive. And you probably didn't plan for them. And finally, about giving back. You can give back through your family and through your friends and through your work life, rather than doing something giant. 
And I never considered myself a really charitable person, but what I've tried to do is to give back in ways that were meaningful to me, that I could be passionate about, but that also, because of my busy life, I was raising two children, I was working 15 hours a day, I was able to do, because there wasn't that much I could actually give more of myself. So let me tell you a little bit about how life is accidental. I applied to Holy Cross because it was close to my house and because it had a great pre-med program. I lasted in pre-med for one semester. <laughs> and then I became an economics major. And the benefits were wonderful. I found that I really liked economics, that it came easily to me, and I found a love of business from it. The other benefits that I got from going to Holy Cross, I met my husband. I met him in the third week of school. Now, some of you might say, there were 200 women and 2,000 men, and you met him in the third week of school. What were you thinking? <laughs> but truthfully, <laughs> I did. And we've been together for 40 years. We'll celebrate our 34th wedding anniversary um, on April 1st, in case you wanted to get out of it. Um, and it, it's been a fabulous relationship. Um, the other thing that I didn't know when I applied to Holy Cross was that it was an all-boys school. I went to a public school. I thought all schools were co-ed, so I just applied. So as a pioneer in the first class of women, I only knew that after I was accepted. So, but for me, it was actually one of my life-changing experiences because I worked on Wall Street for 30 years. And to be able to sit in a room full of men and not be the least bit in intimidated was what I learned at Holy Cross. And so for me, it was an absolutely wonderful benefit of coming here, but while I was going through it, I had no idea that was going to be a wonderful benefit. So I think that, you know, Holy Cross has been, for me, a place where I learned a lot about myself, I met the love of my life, and I was able to see myself as something different because I was in that first class of women. Um, then I began to look for work. And that's where I say, find your passion. I uh, sent out 100 resumes when I was a senior. I got one job offer, and it was in Pittsburgh, selling coffee for Procter & Gamble to supermarkets. And I did that job for a year, and I hated every minute of it. Hated every minute of it. I didn't know anybody. I was calling on supermarkets. I was stocking shelves. It was not my idea of what my career was going to be like. So I left, and I was reading a woman's magazine, and I saw an ad from Merrill Lynch. And Merrill Lynch was looking for stockbrokers. So I applied to be a stockbroker. I didn't actually know what a stockbroker was. But I knew I wanted to live in New York, and I knew I liked financial stuff, and I knew I liked investing, so I applied to be a stockbroker. Went through their training program, and I find out later that basically I was hired because I had some sales experience and they were looking for women because they weren't hiring a lot of women then. Now, I will tell you, it's not much different today. There were, they had a goal of about 10% women in 1977 when I went to Merrill Lynch, and there are about 15% women stockbrokers today. So not much difference in what there was in the past and what there is today. But I found I didn't like that either. So after about 18 months, I left that job. And I stayed at Merrill Lynch, though, and I went into product management. And I really found my passion. I loved it. I did that for 20 years, <laughs> going up through the ranks. We built the IRA business for Merrill Lynch, which we opened a million accounts in our first year. I ran the 401k business for Merrill Lynch. We brought in $125 billion in assets, and we had 3 million participants in our system. We were the second largest 401k provider in the United States. It was exciting, it was thrilling. And what were the things that I learned? That What did I like and what did I didn't like? Well, what I found was I didn't like being a stockbroker because I did the same thing every day. I like novelty. I found I like novelty. So for me, product development was a fabulous thing because I was able to figure out what to do that would be different, new, and exciting. I also found I loved sales because I loved being able to convince people to do things because they wanted to not because I, had, I was making them do it. So that was another thing that I found out. And since I know that now about myself, I, do, I look for those kind of roles. But you don't find that out when you're in school. You find it out when you're out working, and you find, oh, God, I hate this job. I just really can't stand going to work every day. And then go find something else, because you can't make a lot of money, and you can't be really successful unless you're pursuing your passion. Um, in 2010, I retired, and I had a goal, I met one of my goals, which was that my dad retired at 56 and I retired at 55. And I was gonna make sure I retired before him. 
But since then, I really missed working. So I've joined the advisory board of a mutual fund, which gives me the freedom to travel where I want to and when I want to. And I've also, I'm also hopefully filing a patent for a financial service business method. And both of those two things will help me run my life the way I like to, doing new things, but without the uh, bureaucratic oversight that accompanied most of my career. So for me, that's the way I'm living out the rest of my life. So I think that that's something when you consider what you're doing, try a few things. I have to tell you, I never thought that I would be excited about selling 401k plans to institutions. That was not like my big career goal. But I loved it, and it was really fun. So try different things and make sure you do what you like because the people you're competing with do like what they're doing. There's also some things that happen. I said don't worry, be happy because the things that happen to you that are really horrible are things that you probably didn't think about. On September 11th in 2001, I was looking out my window, it was quarter nine, it was a beautiful day, and all of a sudden, the building across from me was in flames. And we didn't know what it was, we thought it was an accident. What did we know? We had no news, right? And so we, luckily, I would say, the people that I worked with at Oppenheimer Funds had been in the building in 1996. And when the, when the building management told them to stay, they did. And the building filled up with smoke, and it was horrible trying to get out. So they always said, if anything ever happens, evacuate the building immediately. So we did. We began to evacuate the building. We walked down 30, we were on the 33rd floor. We walked down 33 flights of stairs, and by the time the second plane hit, we were at the base level of the building. They closed all the doors because where they were evacuating everybody was where the plane hit. So they had to close that door. So we had to evacuate onto the street. And by then, I think we were all in shock. And frankly, I think that most of us were in shock for about 18 months after 9-11. I took the subway, dumb move, right? I took the subway uptown because I wasn't going to walk. So I was probably already in shock. I went to Grand Central, and I waited for my train. Instead of taking any train out of there, I waited for my train because I was probably in shock. They closed down Grand Central, and I said, oh my god, I'm not sleeping on the street. So I went to the Waldorf. And if any of you know me, that's exactly where I would go. <laughs> so when three hours later I got in touch with my family, they're like, where are you, where are you? I think I'm covered with dust and everything. I'm like, I'm at the Waldorf. <laughs> so, so, you know, but I think one of the things that I want, the lessons that I wanted to give you about 9-11 was that when the first plane hit, we were in a big group all the people that work with me, and we got everybody rounded up and we started walking down the stairs. The building management was telling us to stay there. So by the time we got to the ninth floor, I opened the door and all I could smell was jet fuel. So I said, no, no, let's keep going, let's keep going. I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, you saved my life. Well, frankly, I wasn't really thinking about that. But what the lesson that it taught me was that when you're in a leadership position, people want you to tell them what to do and they want to follow you. So that if, be aware, when you're a supervisor, or when you're a senior manager, or wherever you are, when you have the responsibility for other people, they are going to listen to you. They are going to do what you say. So make sure that you pay attention to them and make sure that you try to do the right thing. Now whether or not that could have been the wrong thing, I suppose, but it worked out to be the right thing. Another thing that happened was, I got cancer in 2010. Well. No one in my family has cancer. I had no experience with it, couldn't worry about it because nobody ever had it. We all had heart disease. So all of a sudden, I, it was disbelief, shock. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like, I'm not supposed to die now. I'm supposed to live till I'm 93. That's my plan anyway. <laughs> so, and I was really scared of chemo. I was really scared. I was, I was just so afraid. I was afraid of losing my hair. I was afraid of being sick. I was afraid of everything. And I had the surgery, I went through the chemo, I'm still having chemo, but it's not as bad as it was. Lost my hair, my nails got brown, it's 14 months, there's no cancer, I'm still here. And I think you find that you're a lot stronger than you think you're going to be if you have to go through something. Because basically you have no choice, you have to do it. So you do. And I think that... Um, you know, with this kind of cancer, there's like a 70% chance of recurrence. But I know I could do it again. I just know I could. 
because it's one of those things that you can live through. It's a, I now treat it as a chronic disease like diabetes. I'm just going to live with it, and that's the way it is, and I'm going to move on. And so, and hopefully, I'll be one of the 30% that I won't get a recurrence, and my hair will grow really long, and I'm going to grow really long, <laughs> and my nails will be really long. But, um, but there are some things I also learned from the cancer experience. They were that I found out I have the best husband anybody could ever have. You know, we kind of worked as partners. We didn't pay much attention to each other. We both worked, and we were raising the kids. We were doing everything. The minute that I got sick, he was there for me every second. And I got a blood clot as part of the treatment. And I called him, and he was at, in uh, 10 blocks away. And I said, oh, my God, I have a blood clot. Oh, my God, I have a blood clot. He couldn't get a cab. He ran 10 blocks to Sloan Kettering. It's like amazing, right? Totally amazing. Um, I also found that my girlfriends were wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful people. Now, I find that my dad has a recurrence of cancer from 10 years ago. And going to the doctors with him, I can really help him. I know what to do. I can tell him not to be afraid. He's never had chemo. I can do all of those things. So there's very, very positive things, negative things too, yes, but very, very positive things that come out of all of this that these bad experiences can really bring you. However, Worrying about any of those things, they, those would never have been the things I would have worried about. I worry about my kids getting in trouble, or I worry about things like that. I didn't worry about those things. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about giving back. Sorry, I'm so hot. <laughs> like dying of the heat. Um, some of you women will know when you're 50 how that feels. <laughs> but in giving back, um, I never consider myself a really charitable person, but I've always tried to like, you know, help my family, help my friends. Um, I have an affinity to Holy Cross, so I've always tried to do whatever Holy Cross asks me. Um, but I think that the way you can give back is give back through your work or give back through something that you actually care about, and it needs to be a passion for you as well. So for me, one of my passions is financial literacy for women, because if you work in financial services, you will see that Although women control 63% of the wealth in the United States, they don't actually pay attention to it very much. And today, if you're a woman over 65, you have a 50% chance of having income below the poverty level. And like, think about that. Do you want your mothers to live like that? And why does that happen? Well, most women live 15 years longer than their husbands because they're younger than their husbands and they have a longer life expectancy. So they become the stewards of the wealth that the family created. But 85% of them make a decision around those finances in a time of crisis, because they won't look at that until then. They don't want to worry about it. They don't want to think about it. So one of the things that I did in the 30 years that I was working in the financial services industry is give lectures to women. And not women investors, but women who are regular people who needed to be concerned about themselves. If you look at long-term care, most women are the ones who need long-term care. Most women don't buy long-term care. You have a 40% chance of being disabled, not of dying, but you buy life insurance, but you don't buy disability insurance. So all of those kind of things are the things that it became a passion for me to be able to educate women so that I could explain to them, look, take care of yourself. That's not not taking care of your family. If you don't take care of yourself first, then you won't be able to take care of your family. So, and, and so, the, and the average age of widow, widowhood, now this is an average, right? The average age of widowhood is like 56 years old. It's not that old. So a lot of women can expect to live a large majority of their lives as single people. And so they need to take care of themselves. And I would counsel anybody who's starting out from school, put as much money away as you can in your retirement plan buy life insurance, take care of yourself. Whether you're a man or a woman, make sure you accumulate savings because the chances are you're going to have to live on those savings when you retire. So that's one of the things, see I started my other speech, sorry. So <laughs> that's one of the things that we do advocate for um, as, as some, a woman in the financial services industry. The other thing that I did was that I, after having cancer, I joined the board of the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition. So that, and their goal is to educate women and their families on the symptoms of ovarian cancer. Because 
it's a very silent killer. Most 60% of ovarian cancer is uh, diagnosed as late stage because you have no real symptoms. There are no symptoms. There are no lumps. There are no bumps. And there are standard things that people ignore, like you have heart problems or you have stomach problems. Um, so those are the kind of things that people can ignore and say, ah, I'm just getting old. But if you have weight gain that you can't um, understand, if you get full too quickly, you know, you eat a meal and, you're, and you get filled up too fast, if you have those kind of problems or your mother does, make sure you have it checked out because the early, if you get caught in stage one, it's 90% curable. So the key is catch it in stage one. And finally, so that you all don't die of the heat, I just wanted to tell you a few more things. For me, my family's always come first. I have a wonderful husband. I have two wonderful sons. I have a mother who told me, you can do anything you want to do. I believed her. <laughs> I have a father who told me, winds don't quit and only babies cry. So I also believed that I had to be tough and, and keep going. Um, I have many friends. And that's been wonderful for me. So I just want to make sure that as you think about your life and you think about what you want to do, you take advantage of opportunities. Understand that they may not be the ones you thought they would be, but they can still be awesome. Also, that be passionate about what you're doing. You do only have one life. And you actually really only have one career. So you might as well like it instead of coming home and yelling at your wife and your dog or your husband and your dog. Because wives do it too, I have to say. And don't worry, because really, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I decided with all of these things that if it happens again, I'll worry about it then. But I'm not going to worry about it now. And then give back if you can, because if you can give back, you can probably change somebody's life. And also love your families, because they're only here for a little while. So. That's what I have to say, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Is there questions, or do I leave? <laughs> As a junior, well, my husband graduated, so I was having a lot of fun, but no. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I, think, I think what Holy Cross really taught me, and it's not just about being a junior, was that it teaches you how to think and it teaches you how to question things. And I don't think it matters what your major was um, to learn that. I think it's the way the school is. It encourages that. And so I think, above all, even though some people might say I asked too many questions, I think above all, I think that would be what Holy Cross has taught me. To not be afraid to ask questions, to not be afraid to challenge convention, and not in a like radical way, but just in a way say, you know what, maybe there's a better way to do this. You know? So I think that that's really what Holy Cross gave me. And my husband. <laughs> Yeah, the old boys club. I really think that's what it is. I mean, actually, Jules interviewed me today, and she said, you know, well, what do you think about these diversity programs? What do you think about this? And I don't think it's just women. I think it's minorities, too. I, you know, it's both. Um, it's, a, it's a closed community, and it's very aggressive, and it's very macho. And I happen to kind of be very aggressive. And maybe I'm macho, too. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be willing to ignore the stuff that goes on and you have to be willing to say, look, I don't care if you're doing that. I'm still, I still want to do my job, and I'm going to be successful. And then you have to make sure that you're producing. And I think that, that that's the hard part, because it's difficult to be a woman where you're isolated. You're not invited to the golf outings. You're isolated from a lot of the social events, and then not to quit. You have to find your own way. So I think that that's where. And it's true for minorities as well. It's not just true for women. And, and that's why it's kind of a closed club. Now, 
if I were a young white guy and somebody was moving me along and helping me, I wouldn't be interested in helping anybody else either. So I think the culture does that too, you know? And it's not that I'm against white guys because I got two sons and I'm going to hope that they get really great jobs. So <laughs> but I just think it's just, it's a cultural thing. And it is, and it's very aggressive. So, but it's very financially rewarding. So it's worth it if you're willing to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Donna, what did you think of Greg Smith's op-ed piece? I didn't read it, so I don't know. The one on uh, Goldman Sachs. Oh, I think he's going to make a lot of money writing a book. Um, Michael Lewis did that about Solomon Brothers many, many years ago and became a famous writer, and he's a fabulous writer now. Um, you know, if I had been at Goldman Sachs for 10 years and I did something like that, I think that that means he's just dissatisfied. That would be my impression of it, that he's just dissatisfied, disgruntled, I guess would be a better word, and that he wanted to lash out at somebody, you know? So, yes? Can you speak a little bit to the, the work-life balance that you talk about 15-hour days and two boys, I happen to have two boys myself, and straddle that um, work-life balance all the time and just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. I would say that there is no life-work balance on Wall Street. It's, it's a 70% solution. When you're at work, you feel guilty that you're not at home. When you're at home, you feel guilty that you're not at work. Um, but I loved work. And I love my children, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, so I would try to manage both of them. You know, you try to get good care for your kids. And you try to find a staff that understands your situation and a boss that understands your situation um, so that you can get by during the difficult times. So, you know, I don't actually, I think maybe in some times there's balance, but during that 15 years when you can have kids and you can ha really move your career along, I took three weeks maternity leave and two weeks maternity leave. That's all I took. I could they gave me three months, but if I had come back in three months, everything would have been different. Now, since then, and I would also say the more female mentors there are in senior positions at Wall Street firms, the more likely that that will be because I always told my women, take the three months. Don't be an idiot, right? Because if someone broke their leg, I would tell them to stay home for six weeks. So, and some people say having a baby is a choice. Breaking your leg might not have been a choice. But you didn't have to go skiing either. So, <laughs> so I think that, so, it's, so I've tried to be nurturing and helpful with all of that. But I think in general, you're not, you just, it's not very balanced. It's just like very stressful. <laughs> Having been faced with the really the um, tragedies of life itself, um, with the cancer, would you do anything differently with respect to that work life um, balance now? Um, actually, I could die right now and say I wouldn't have changed a thing, to tell you the truth. Now, I don't want to die, so, because <laughs> I have a lot more things I want to do. but. I think that hindsight, you know, as it is, I don't regret very much. I mean, I made choices, and some of them probably weren't the best at times, but I really don't regret anything that I did. I, I wish I had learned more, maybe, spent more time learning, but I have trouble sitting still, so I'm not sure that it actually works that well. But I, so, no, I, I, I don't think I would change a thing. I don't think I would have studied harder, and I wasn't that great a student. I don't think I would have partied less. I don't think I would have. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Going off what you just said, is there any words of advice you give to current semester seniors who are applying to education and students like that? Well, look for a job. That'd be one. <laughs> um, I will tell you that when I was applying for jobs in 1976, the unemployment rate was exactly the same as it is now. So. And college, people with a college degree don't ha have like a 4% unemployment rate. It's not, it's not the 8% or whatever. So, um, so it's not as hard as you think to find jobs. You just have to be persistent. And you probably won't love your first job. And that's OK. You know? But I would say, yeah, go out and experience the world. I mean, don't delay it. Because all you're doing is delaying your opportunities, I think. But 
No, I mean, I told you I sent 100 resumes. I got one job, so. I mean, it wasn't great the first couple of years, but then it was great, so. <laughs> and enjoy your life. Okay, go outside. Oh, yes, okay. Um, I was just wondering, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave um, for your family? Or, I guess, for um, any of the, those you encounter? Well, if I was going to die shortly, I would say that um, I would like to leave a legacy of that I tried to help them as much as I could, that I was as generous as I could be, that I pushed them as hard as I could, and that I gave them the best that I could. But I'm hoping to live another 40 years and do a whole bunch of different legacy stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Go outside and enjoy the rabbit.